What happened? The line quit? Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. Philippians 4.6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That means everything. So I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, tonight's Bible study. We're going to be continuing our series on urgent message, the rapture, millions will soon disappear, and this is going to be episode 14. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, noten veshomeret varech, lelamed liadrik hut leyanchot otanu, vederek sheba aleinu lelechet, aleidei pechat aneinu ozaneinu vilevno, leman timsor lanu merachmatech ked yatra udvunatech, venir ech niflaot mitoratra. Sherwa hakodesh shelachak tanchet kolanu el kolahemet, merachet limud, hamilash elecha beshem Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, giver and preserver of your word, Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way that we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. So in this next section, I'm going to be expounding on righteousness, what it is, what it does, and how we attain it. And before I get there, I'm going to be expounding on Adam's image in connection to righteousness. Now, you may be asking, what does this have to do with missing the rapture? Absolutely everything. God requires righteousness, and He's very particular which righteousness you will have, His or your own. That you are before or after the rapture, you need to know which righteousness is the one God commanded you to go after. Very important for you to know this information. If you're relying on the wrong work of righteousness in the economy or the dispensation that you're actually in, it will be devastating for you in eternity future. Take care and attention to understanding the two types of righteousnesses in the Bible. Paul taught the righteousness of Yeshua HaMashiach, which is imputed to the believer, and the Old Testament type of righteousness, which was worked out by the believer according to the commandments of his particular time. Question, what does righteousness do? Righteousness brings a man closer to God as he enhances fellowship with Almighty God. That's what righteousness does. Now this closeness to God, that is between the Creator and His creation, is seen before Adam fell. Adam enjoyed divine fellowship with God walking in a cool of the day in the Garden of Eden. So I'd like for you to turn to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam, and he said unto him, Where art thou? Now this comes right after that they had sinned, that they had disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God was already in the habit of walking with Adam. Part of his image was righteousness, which I'm going to get to in not too long. But after he sinned, what happened is God asked him the question, Where are you? Well, I hid myself. So let's read in verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, speaking of God, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? As soon as this happened, Adam lost his righteousness. He lost contact with God. He ends up getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So righteousness is tied in to acting in accord with divine or moral law. This ensures you being free from guilt or sin. Adam had this righteousness when he was created, which also included true holiness and knowledge in his original nature. After Adam's disobedience, he lost that righteousness, thus losing that sweet fellowship he had with God. And righteousness is needed to restore fellowship between you and your God, that is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Righteousness is required on your part for you to walk with God, and that's our justification. Adam was created in the image of God, and I personally found two images God has in which Adam was made in. One is physical, the other one is spiritual. And by spiritual here I mean pertaining to man's original nature when God first created him. So, the first image is physical, and is found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, man's creation. So I'd like for you to turn there. And in Genesis 2, 7 it says, And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here we find God, number one, forming man's body from the ground. And then number two, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That is, he gave man a spirit that comes from God, which quickened him, meaning made him alive. And number three, man became a living soul, which is the eternal part of the man. Paul mentions the same three components or parts that constitutes a man. He corroborates and confirms with Genesis 2.7. To be called a human being, all three parts need to simultaneously be present and intact. When you go to a funeral home, that's just the body. The soul and spirit have gone to their place. 
All three parts are distinct one from the other. The soul is not the body and the body is not the spirit. Now the Godhead has the same tripartite composition, thus having made man in the same fashion and image of himself. So I want you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, as I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When a person dies, the body goes back to the dust. I want you to go back to Genesis 3.19. And it says, In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now the Spirit goes back up to God who gave it. I want you to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 19. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them, as one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all have one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, so all is vanity. Verse 20, all go unto one place, all are made of dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? Now, the eternal part of a person is a soul. At death it goes either straight to heaven, or in God's presence, or to hell, which is basically a waiting room waiting for their judgment for the great white throne. And by the way, there's no purgatory. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6 through 8. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And this is speaking of the soul. Now it's pretty clear here, if your soul is not the body, it's in God's presence, if you are in Christ. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now the believer's presence is with the Lord. Where Jesus is, we are. We are not on earth sleeping in the grave or soul sleep, nor are we in a special place neither here nor there, or somewhere in outer space as some people believe. I asked Google, where do we go when we die? And Google nailed it. It said, normally the body is transported to a morgue or mortuary. We're going to see in this next example how the soul and body are distinct from each other. Mm. Turn to Genesis chapter 35 and we'll start reading in verse 18. Now it came to pass as her soul was in the parting, for she died, that she called his name Benoni. But his father called him Benjamin. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrath, which is Bethlehem. So here you have her soul is in the parting and then they buried her. So these are the two distinct parts of the body and soul. Rachel's soul departed, she died and she was buried. The soul is not the body. They are distinct from each other. The body is buried and departed souls go to their place. We saw the believer's eternal place. Let's look at the natural man, the lost man, the man that has no knowledge of God and see his final eternal reality. I want you to turn to Luke 16 verse 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So here you have two people. One of them was the beggar. He died and the angels, they brought him to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and he was buried. It just says that. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. So when he closed his eyes, his earthly eyes, and he reopened them in hell, could you imagine his shock? This guy must have been freaking out. And by the way, he's going to be freaking out for the rest of eternity. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came to redeem man. He came to save us from our sins. He came to pay us a debt that we could never repay. That's why I'm here telling you this. That's why I take the time to study, to try to figure out the scriptures as best as I can. Both bodies were buried and both souls departed to go to their place right after that they basically had passed away. Now the second image that God instilled in man is spiritual. In man's original state, he possessed these three natures. And after their sin or disobedience against God, they actually lost it. So number two, the second image man had was, past tense, Spiritual, again, by spiritual here I mean pertaining to man's original nature. When God first made him, man had righteousness, true holiness, and knowledge. This was God's image instilled in man. Now these three characteristics were lost the second that Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And God's image and likeness was lost to Adam, but by the way, it could be regained. Adam's fallen state now infects all his descendants. We are now made in Adam's fallen likeness an image. Every child that is born, we have Adam's likeness and his image. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. 
This is the book of the generations of Adam, in the day that God created man in the likeness of God, made he, speaking of God, him, man. Verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, not God's image and likeness. And he called his name Seth. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now you're going to notice here that when God created man, he was created in the image and likeness of God. When we read in Genesis chapter 5, after Adam had disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil, that Seth was made, he begat a son in his own image, in the image of Adam, in his own likeness. So the fallen Adam now transfers his image and his likeness to his son and to all the other peoples that are going to be coming from their loins. So at birth, no one has these original attributes. We basically lost it. Before I go on, you need to understand something. What your disobedience to God entails. The act of disobeying God's law produces sin in your life, thus separating you from Him. Now Webster defines sin this way. Sin is the voluntary departure of a moral agent, of a person, from a known rule of rectitude or duty prescribed by God. Or basically of your own free will going out there and breaking God's command. Any voluntary transgression of the divine law or violation of a divine command. This following one falls into two categories. Number one, sin is either a positive act in which a known divine law is violated. Or two, it is the voluntary neglect to obey a positive divine command or a rule of duty clearly implied in such a command. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression or the breaking of the law. I want you to turn to James 4, 17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So here you see the contrast. The breaking of a law, of going against it. For you to know to do good, let's say holding the door for somebody, and you don't do it. You're not holding the door or helping somebody with something. You know that you can do good and you don't do it. To you, that is a sin. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of the people in the churches don't know that. So sins comprehend not actions only, but neglect of known duty. All evil thoughts, purposes, words, desires, whatever is contrary to God's command or law. By you engaging yourself in reading, studying, and meditating on Scripture, and applying, applying what you learn, this should keep you from sin. Because if your nose is buried in a book, you don't have time to go out there and cause trouble. Only by having the Holy Spirit sealed within you can you accomplish this with ease. Because there's a war in your members between your flesh and your spirit. Your flesh now has a worthy opponent. The flesh says, oh no. And the spirit says, oh boy, we're going to have some fun here. So the flesh is going to pull you with whatever appetites that your flesh desires. You've got gossip, hatred, variance, emulations, arrogance, pride. You've got fornications, adulteries. You've got a whole bunch of these things which are the works of the flesh. You've got, for example, the indulgences of the flesh. You've got alcohol, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness, drugs. It's something that it just craves for. Then you've got the mental addictions. You've got gambling is another one. That seems to be more of a mental thing, but it's actually infused in your actual body. And then you've got the spirit that says, no, I don't want you to do these things. Love, peace. Peace, joy, happiness, long-suffering, temperance. This is how I want you to walk. All of a sudden, your flesh is, is pulling you this way. The Spirit is pulling you this way. And this is where the fight happens. If you are a lost person, you're a lost man, you're a lost woman, you do not have the Spirit of God within you. You are going to lose. The flesh will always win. The amount of willpower that you're going to need is something incredible. And very few basically succeed in that. For example, you want to go on a diet. How many people in the end they say, oh, you know what, forget this. Because my flesh wants the alcohol, it wants the chocolates, it wants the food, it wants the whatever it is. And there's always a constant battle. But once the spirit is in, the battle is still there. But you're going to notice a lot of the times you're going to be giving in more to the spirit than you are going to be giving in to your flesh. Two forces surge within my breast. One is foul, the other blessed. One I love, the other I hate. The one I feed will dominate. If you look at Paul, Romans 7, Romans 8, the things he wanted to do, he wasn't doing. The things he didn't want to do, those things he was doing. Yet it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in my flesh. So this is what he was saying. So there's going to be a constant battle. As a person who's been filled and sealed with the Holy Spirit, because we are in the flesh, there's this massive fight going on. If ever you sin, that you do fall, say, Lord, forgive me, help me in whatever area 
that you're actually falling in your life. The Lord is there to help. The Lord is there to guide. We have the Holy Spirit inside us. And the more you start leaning on the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, you're going to notice that you're going to start leaving some of the things of the flesh. Right now I'm looking at all of you, right? So I'm, my, my head is horizontal. But what happens when I look vertical? If I'm looking vertical, I don't see anybody. I've got my eyes fixed on the Lord. But the minute I do that, that I take my attention off of the Lord and I look down, there's all kinds of problems. But you having your nose in the scriptures, reading, studying, meditating on God's word, it's another way of looking vertical because it's his word that you have on your lap. Have you ever walked into a house that just burnt? Just walk through to take a look and come back out. There's no more fire. You come out, the smell of the fire is going to be on your clothes. You just got some of that stuff on you. That stuff might even start affecting you, it might start affecting your mind. Get up and get out. Who are your friends? The people that you stick around with, you are going to become like them. If your character is stronger, you are going to affect them that they're going to become like you. But there's a very good chance that you're going to become like them. But you're reading, studying, and meditating on Scripture. The Lord is there to guide. The Lord is there to basically take you by the hand and to guide you. We pray, say, Lord, help me. When we're in a situation, you pray. The first thing you have to do is pray. Don't get to the end of the situation and then you decide to pray. No. At the beginning, I used to pray at the end. I've exhausted everything that I can do. I don't know what to do anymore. Lord, could you please help? Okay, you want my help now? Not a problem. All of a sudden, He fixes everything. When I saw them, that why don't I pray at the beginning? So I don't have to go through all that turmoil. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, it says, Be not deceived. Don't think you're stronger. Don't think you're wiser. Don't be deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. If you're walking with the Lord and you're being communicated something to you to walk the other way, don't go there. If you look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 10, it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down to the pit. We shall find all precious substance, we shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in thy lot among us, and let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way with them, refrain thy foot from their path. But if you read at least chapter 1 of Proverbs, it starts off the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtility to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. We are all born without knowledge and we are all born without discretion. By coming to the scriptures, the Lord will give you these things. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain unto wise counsels. To understand the proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise, and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Who are the people you're running with? If anybody around you, don't look at the blood relation, mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, cousin, whatever it is, and they're bringing you down, they're leading you away from the Lord, turn away from them and turn to the Lord. Turn to the Lord, walk with the Lord. Don't be deceived. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Who are you sticking around with? What is it that you're doing? Stop doing it. You're having a hard time. You get on your knees and start praying. You're having a hard time. Start fasting and praying and don't tell anybody you're fasting and praying for it. You're really having a hard time. Find a couple of people that you know that you can say, Hey, listen, I'm going through a hard time. Can you please pray specifically for this in my life? I'm trying to get over and above this. So to get back with what I was saying, only by having the Holy Spirit sealed within you can you accomplish this with ease because there's a war between your spirit and your flesh. Your flesh now has a worthy opponent. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 59 and verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is here heavy that it cannot hear. Verse 2, But your inequities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. Now if your sins or your disobedience to God's commandment have separated between you and God, and this separation still exists between you and God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, when you die, that will be your state for the rest of eternity. If you're separated here between you and your God, when you die and you close your eyes here in death, when you open your eyes, God will not be in front of you. God's already separated himself from you because of sin. But Jesus came, Yeshua came, to redeem us from the curse of the law. By him dying on the cross and paying for your sins, he made the way. He became the bridge between you and God. Like it says in 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So he becomes our mediator. 
becoming my mediator when I close my eyes in death and I reopen them on the other side, because he was my mediator, he's the one that actually took me by the hand and says, you know what? Now you can come into the kingdom. This is what the Lord Jesus Christ did. If you haven't reconciled yourself to God before you die, he will hide his face from you forever. He will see you but you won't see him. Adam, having lost that spiritual quote-unquote nature, inherits a depraved or a corrupt human nature. Corrupt meaning changed from good to bad, devoid of godly character. Yeshua came to help man regain that lost nature, which is acceptable to God. When one is in Christ, all three godly natures are reinstated. Paul explains it as putting on the new man. When God's Holy Spirit makes his abode or literally indwells in you, you basically become a new creature. There's something happening to you that you didn't have before, and that's why it makes you a new creature. I'm still the same creature, but there's something that's been instilled, that's been imputed in me, that all of a sudden now it makes me a new creature. Or basically you have just put on a new man. There was the old man, the old corrupt way, with whatever sins, flesh, mind, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, whatever it is that you had. Because the pride of life is going to sink you back into the ground. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, that is something incredible. It's a massive hole that the more you keep putting in of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, the more you put in, the more empty it is. Many people come to realize this at the end of their lives or much further on in their lives. But this is the natural man. That's all you know. Could you imagine you're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old? I've heard people getting saved at 90, 95 years old and people on their deathbeds. What does that old world have to do for me? Strip clubs, drinking, friends partying, drinking beer until there's no tomorrow. And then you wake up with a head like this the next morning. What does that give me in the end? Yeah, there's things that are going to be scary. Yeah, there are going to be things that you don't know. Things that you never seen or heard before. Hey, this is weird. This goes against my belief. This goes against what I've been taught. But that's what the world taught you. Satan in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says Satan is the god of this world. And he's indoctrinated everybody to think a particular way. Look at what's happening out there. You've got to be careful with what words you use. But this is where we are. So the Lord is calling these people out. So as I'm leading this person, people, as much as I can, to say, hey, walk over there. It's not going to be an easy walk. I'm telling you now, it's not going to be an easy walk. But I'd rather have this harder of a walk because it's a much tighter path if you want. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Everybody is going to destruction. Everybody in the world are on their highway to hell. But there's only one stairway to heaven. You're seeing something that you've never seen before and you're comparing it to your old life and that's normal. Some stuff is scary. It's like, ah, if I become a Christian, oh man, I'm going to become boring. What are you, nuts? This is one of the most exciting lives that you can have. But because you don't know what's happening on this side of the door, don't say what you think might be. Because once you've come in, once you've seen the joy that you have, the happiness that you have in the Lord, it's blissful. It's just amazing. But you're going to also have to help yourself. You've got the red phone. You just give me a call. Lord, I've got a situation. I've got a problem. And that's the red phone. Everybody has that red phone. The minute you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you repent of your sins, believing in your heart in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are automatically given that phone. You call in any time, no matter what time it is, no matter what the situation is. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That means everything. Do you know how many friends you're going to be losing? And you know why? Because what is it that they're bringing in your life? Here, have another beer. For what? So I can stay smashed longer on the floor? Good for you. And these are your friends. So to get back to what I was saying, when God's Holy Spirit makes His abode or literally indwells in you, you become a new creature or you have put on a new man. And those attributes of knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness will be reinstated in you. Putting on the new man denotes the changed desires and purposes of a renewed heart. You don't want to go back to the old world. You have a new heart. You have a new mind. You've got a new vision. You're going to notice that you're going to be more at peace. You know where you're going. But coming from that world and you stay there, picture this for the rest of eternity. Here at least I've got a smile on my face. Righteousness is one of the attributes that is regained. This righteousness opens a direct relationship with God. It's not being in a group or it's not being in the church that you're in. It's a relationship between you and your God. That's what you need to understand. That's what salvation is. Jesus, Yeshua died 
for you. You come of your own self and you recognize that you're a sinner. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God commended His love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So as Christ died for us, He reinstates this righteousness which is imputed in us, which is a gift. You'll find that in Romans chapter 5 also. I want you to watch very carefully how Paul words this next thought. In Colossians 3.10 it says, And have put on the new man, which is renewed, or restored, in knowledge, after the image of him, speaking of God, that created him. Notice renewed in knowledge, after the image of God who created us. Renewed meaning to restore to a former state, after putting on the new man. I want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24. And it says that he put on the new man, which after God is created, as at the beginning with Adam, in righteousness and true holiness. When you put on the new man, what Adam lost in righteousness, the fellowship with God, we regain that. The true holiness, we regain that. That is within us. So as we walk with the Lord, yes, there are times that we walk that we are not walking in true holiness. I completely understand that. But if you make it that point where no person will ever see God, if you don't have true holiness, hey buddy, I've got true holiness. The minute you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is something that He gives you. I've got that true holiness now. Don't look at because I fall. The holiness is there. And every day as I'm sanctified, as I walk day by day, second by second with the Lord, He cleanses me. He makes me clean. The true holiness is already there. It's we are still living in the flesh. And if you're making an axe on that only, all of a sudden you're going to start falling into legalism. Because, oh, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. And who are you? The true holiness police. I've already came out of some of those churches. It is ugly. Once you're caught in the whirlwind, in that mentality, it just brings you down without you realizing it. They gave me enough to wrap my head around to say, hey, you know what? These people are completely wrong. Of course I'm going to fall. One of the greatest men, Paul the Apostle, he fake it fall. That means I can fall and I'm a nobody. So this renewed nature includes knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. It is renewed or restored and created after God's image. So what God created in Adam, when you have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost sealed inside you, this image and this likeness of God is reinstated in you. This is what you have inside you. So this is Adam's original image before he disobeyed God. When you put on the new man, this is where you become spiritual. Not because you say a few words, God, Jesus Christ, and the Bible, all of a sudden this person is spiritual. Are you feeling good? It's something that happens inside you. And once you've got this, it starts oozing out from you without even you saying a word. People are going to see it. People are going to feel it. And this is pertaining to the renewed nature of man. And this is where we get our spiritual life. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 22. That he put off concerning the former conversation. Remember the old world I was talking about? You start taking that off. You start taking that mentality out. You start taking that out of your body. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You take that and you throw it because there's nothing good about it. So that you put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Now the word conversation, putting off concerning the former conversation, what does the word conversation mean? The first meaning is a general course of manners, behavior, deportment, especially in respect to morals. So you put off your old ways of thinking and being. And what happens? Look at verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. After God it's created. God created the first time, He screwed it up. All of a sudden, He's giving us a second chance. By you coming to the Lord, by you putting your faith and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the gospel of the grace of God that God gave to Paul. Once you believe this, then you can start stepping forward. And by the way, I'd like to make a note over here. The church does not start in Acts chapter 8. The church starts in Acts chapter 2. The minute that the Spirit is given as a gift, all of a sudden now we're working with something else. So the true church, the beginning of the church, they were all Jewish. What happens with Paul in Acts chapter 8 and following? Paul goes out now and he says, okay, the Jews are still going to get their message. I'm going to go out to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were added to the church. I just wanted to make that clear. So under Paul's gospel, by repenting of your sins and confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised Yeshua, Jesus, from the dead, you will be saved. This is putting on the new man. It is the Holy Spirit that's going to be within you. Now righteousness is imputed to you as well as knowledge and true holiness. Imputed righteousness emphasizes that salvation is a gift from God and is dependent upon Him and not us. 
So guys, I give you another mouthful this week. You're going to have a lot to uh, think on. I'm going to stop it here, and next week we're going to pick it up. Next week I'm going to be starting off with contrasting the Old and New Testament righteousnesses. So between now and next week, Lord willing, have yourselves a good week. Amen. 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 So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on His name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.